In 2024, Earth was joined by a mini-moon that orbited around our planet for two months. It hung around, made a few laps, and then, like every polite guest, it left. It went back to resume its trip around the Sun. However, astronomers now say another rock has been tagging along with Earth not for weeks, but for six decades. It's rare and strange, now being classified as a quasi-moon. But what exactly does that mean? Is it like a backup satellite? Unlike our cool and mysterious moon that illuminates our nights and affects werewolves, a quasi-moon doesn't circle Earth. Instead, it orbits the Sun, but it does so almost in perfect sync with us, like a runner doing a marathon with you that keeps a similar pace. Space only seems calm. It's actually pretty chaotic. The Sun, the Moon, Earth, and even other planets are constantly tugging on each other and smaller objects like these rocks. Most asteroids can't hold this delicate balance for long. They either get nudged into a new orbit, pulled closer to Earth, or flung out into the vast reaches of space. That's why we're lucky to spot more than one or two at a time. Most just can't keep the balance. They belong to a bigger family called co-orbitals. In fact, astronomers group them into a few types based on how they move relative to Earth. But unlike the real moon, that's been our companion since the very beginning, these visitors don't stick around forever. Some hang with us for a few decades, others for centuries, before drifting away because the gravity of some other space object. Kinda like a dog running to your neighbor after smelling bacon. One other thing about quasi-moons is their size. Most are tiny, building-sized, or even smaller. They're also so dim that they can hide in plain sight among stars. Still, they're important. By studying them, astronomers learn how small near-Earth objects move and how long they can stay caught in Earth's gravity. Quasi-moons are closer than other asteroids on the same path, and it would be easier to reach them. One day, they might be used as stepping stones in space exploration. Earth has had a few of these tagalongs before. One of the most famous is 2016 H03, nicknamed Earth's Constant Companion. It's only about 300 feet wide, but it's been keeping pace with us for nearly a century. Researchers say it might keep up for centuries more. But what about the most recently discovered one? The researchers named it 2025 PN7. Like we said, it's already been with us for 60 years and will likely stay for around 68 more. For a long time, it remained undiscovered because of its tiny size, only about 62 feet across, which is about the length of a bowling lane. This also answers the question of whether you could see it yourself if you knew where to look. Its backstory is a bit of a mystery. Astronomers haven't figured out its composition yet. Right now, all we know for sure is its trajectory. Some quasi-moons are just near-Earth asteroids that fell into a perfect orbit. Others seem like they could be chunks of the moon itself. For instance, there's another quasi-moon named Kamo'oa'loea that reflects light in almost the same way as the lunar rocks we brought back during the Apollo missions. Because of that, some researchers think it might actually be left over from a huge impact that happened long ago. There's also 2024 PT5, a temporary mini-moon from the end of last year. Tests showed that its surface looks like lunar basalt, suggesting it probably came from the moon. So how do these quasi-moons pull off their cosmic balancing act? That's because it's just an orbital illusion. Remember, PN7, like other quasi-moons, isn't actually circling our planet. To us, it looks like the rock is scribbling lazy loops around Earth's path, like doodles in space. Yet it never lags too much or gets too far. Astronomers call this a one-to-one -one resonance. In plain English, it makes a lap around the Sun every time Earth does. Another fun question. If these fake moons are so close to Earth, why don't we just pull them in with our gravity? Especially since they're tiny and seem so near. That's because even though they belong to a group called near-Earth objects, quasi-moons are not that close. 
our moon is hanging out about 239,000 miles away. These companions, though, are flying around the sun millions of miles out, way beyond Earth's gravitational pull. That pull exists within an area called the Hill Sphere, which is where Earth's gravity is stronger than the sun's. Think of Earth's gravity as a bubble with a radius of about a million miles. Anything inside can get caught, like the real moon. Step outside, and the sun takes over. This is exactly what happened to PT-5, which was our legit satellite for two months in 2024. It dipped inside the Hill Sphere, and Earth's gravity took over. Once it happened, this object became known as a mini-moon. But because it was small and moving fast, it eventually slipped back out of that bubble, and the sun's gravity pulled it away again. One other type of co-orbiter, aside from quasi-moons and mini-moons, is the so-called horseshoe orbiters. These space rocks don't stray far, but from Earth's point of view, they seem to swing ahead of us, slow down, then drift back behind, and repeat. It's like an undercover cop tailing you in traffic but constantly switching lanes and doubling back so you don't notice the pattern. If you trace their motion from Earth, over time, it forms a giant horseshoe shape, hence the name. And these are just the main co-orbiters. There are actually more. Way ahead of us and way behind us in space, there are a few quirky rocks called Trojans. They're not just following right next to Earth like quasi-moons do. Instead, they found two special hiding spots. One 60 degrees in front of us and one 60 degrees behind. Imagine riding your bike and having a friend way ahead of you and another one way behind, both keeping the same speed. That's what Trojans do. Those spots are called Lagrange points, cozy hangout regions where the gravitational pulls from Earth and the Sun balance out perfectly. When they find themselves in one of those areas, they could be staying there for millions of years without drifting away. Jupiter, for example, has tons of these freeloaders. Earth has only a few. Then there are tadpole orbiters. Instead of sitting perfectly still in a Lagrange point, they wobble around it in lazy bean-shaped loops. And if that's not confusing and overwhelming enough, there are also jumping Trojans. The indecisive ones. These guys can't pick a side. They'll spend a few thousand years staying in the front hammock, then slowly drift to one behind us and back again. Rare, weird, and kind of awesome. So even though Earth only has one big moon in the sky, we've actually got a whole gang of intrusive space tagalongs. Some loop, some trail, some hide in the corners. Now let's recap the superpowers of our moon. It can affect tides, slow down Earth's rotation, and even help stabilize our planet's tilt. Without the moon, our days would be shorter, our nights darker, and the seasons way more chaotic. The moon also acts like a giant shield, sweeping up or deflecting some space rocks that might otherwise smack into Earth. And let's not forget its cultural influence. It's been inspiring myths, calendars, love songs, and millions of melancholic walks in the middle of the night. Fake moons can't compete. However, they are important in their own way. Each new quasi-moon we find helps us understand how these little rocks survive in all that cosmic chaos. By learning about our environment, we also learn something about ourselves. They sharpen our detection skills and help us improve our models. So while they'll never shine in the night sky, they still play a quiet role in helping us understand our quirky cosmic neighborhood. It's been decades since the last manned moon landing, Apollo 17, which happened in December 1972. Isn't it time we thought about going back to our dusty satellite and maybe even staying there? NASA has made a promise on this subject. They're preparing to send astronauts on the moon again, perhaps by 2025. This will all happen through a program called Artemis. It's also going to include the first woman ever to experience the lunar surface. Now you might ask, why haven't we done this already? One former NASA administrator said something interesting on the subject. 
It's not because of scientific or technological issues. Problem was that the potential projects took too long and were just too costly. You see, space travel, especially when it involves humans, isn't easy on the pockets. It's true that, in recent years, NASA had budgets of billions of dollars. Sure sounds like enough money, right? Well, not when you check out their to-do list. That's because they have to consider everything. From telescopes and giant rocket projects to missions also targeting the Sun, Jupiter, Mars, and beyond. When you look at it this way, NASA needs to be very good at budgeting to achieve all those goals. It's not just because of finances, though. The moon itself is quite problematic. It poses real dangers that cannot be taken lightly. For starters, its surface is filled with craters and boulders that aren't easy to land on. Then, there is the moon dust, or regolith, if you'd like to call it by its scientific name. It was created over many years by meteorite impacts. It's extremely harsh and sticks to everything. It can potentially damage spacesuits, vehicles, and systems quite quickly. Also, dealing with the lunar habitat isn't a walk in the park either. The moon has no protective atmosphere. What this means is that for 14 days at a time, the lunar surface is faced with harsh rays from the sun. That period is followed by another two weeks of total darkness. All these changes create extreme temperatures, which us humans are not really accustomed to. There are solutions, don't worry. NASA is working on dust and sun, resistant spacesuits and vehicles. They're even developing a system that might supply electricity during those lunar nights. What's even more interesting about this system is it could come in handy on Mars too, once we get there. NASA also needs to draw in really smart people for its projects. Think about it. The average age of the people working for the mission control for Apollo 13 was just 26 years old. And these people had already been part of numerous missions by that time. Which means they'd had considerable experience from a very young age. But here's where other individuals can help too. In recent years, it wasn't just NASA who's been working tirelessly to revolutionize space travel. There are many successful people out there with enough resources to join in on these efforts. Some are developing new types of rockets that can land on the moon, too. In total, NASA landed 12 people on our satellite. It's definitely one of the most awesome moments in its history, if not the best. And those astronauts did amazing things up there. They brought back rocks, took snapshots, did science experiments, and even left flags behind. These were all important moments of the Apollo missions. But they weren't meant to create a safe place for humans on the moon. Scientists have had this idea of a lunar space station for a long time now. It's only logical. After all, it's just a three-day trip from Earth. It means we can, technically, afford to make little mistakes here and there, without messing up the whole project. Plus, we'd learn so much before venturing even further into space. A moon base could provide fuel for deep space missions. We could also build telescopes up there and launch them way easier in space. It could also help us in another important project. Figure out how to make Mars habitable too. Not to mention, a lunar space station would help us learn more about the moon's origin. Who knows, it could even bring in some money because of all that fun, exciting lunar tourism. Either way, the Apollo Moon program took a lot of work. For starters, let's look at the sheer number of people involved. Around 400,000, from every corner of the states. Not everything was picture perfect, tough. There were two main unfortunate events. Firstly, a fire mishap at the launch pad of Apollo 1. Secondly, an oxygen tank decided to throw a tantrum on Apollo 13 causing severe issues mid-mission. An important part of the project was Saturn V. It is to this day the most powerful rocket flown successfully, 
being 36 stories high. Still finding it hard to picture? This rocket stood twice as tall as Niagara Falls. Thanks to Saturn V, NASA successfully completed 13 missions. This included chauffeuring 24 astronauts towards the moon, with half of them even having a little walk on its surface. The existing rockets and space shuttles can't go beyond low Earth orbit. In simpler terms, they can't reach the moon with all the gadgets astronauts need to thrive. Current space vehicles are just not capable of carrying that load, at least not since the Apollo missions happened. Regardless, we did make a lot of progress on Earth and are ready to send astronauts to our satellite pretty soon. Here's where the Artemis project comes in. It's a program overseen by NASA. And to make sure it all goes well, NASA previously launched Orion, a spacecraft with no crew on board to orbit the moon and return to Earth. Think of it as an automated test drive. Before we actually send people out there again, we need to make sure all the devices work properly. One day, Orion will be the vehicle that will take astronauts to the moon again. It features a launch abort system to keep astronauts safe in case something bad happens during launch. It also has a service module, which is the powerhouse that fuels and propels Orion and keeps astronauts alive with water, oxygen, power, and temperature control. All these future projects make one wonder, what will life on the moon be like anyway? We can only use our imagination for now. Some say we'll be living in homes straight out of a fairy tale, something like a cozy hobbit hole. Living underground on the moon might be a must. That's due to the scorching temperatures and the lack of oxygen. If you add meteorite threats and the non-stop radiation, it's no wonder we can't just walk on its surface. What about transportation? Big and small companies alike are trying to create the ideal moon ride. If current estimations are current, one type of moon taxi will take off as soon as 2024. Unlike our current rockets, these space taxis won't have to deal with the harsh conditions of re-entering Earth's atmosphere. It will be easier for them to make multiple round trips. To support our lunar living, we'll need to have a special area for space taxis to safely take off and land. Think of it as a landing pad on a firm, flat stretch of moon surface, protected by walls to shield against moon dust. Moving around on the moon surface will be made easier too. The next generation vehicles we're talking about will have their own controlled environment, which means you won't need a spacesuit while inside. Should feel like stepping out of your space ride for a bit. Then of course, you'll need to put on your spacesuit. All right, so we've got our homes and our rides sorted, but what about fuel? That's where the moon throws us a lifeline. The moon's lighter gravity means we don't need as much power to escape its pull. Plus, the moon has ice, and that's super handy. We might be able to convert this ice into rocket fuel. We'll need dedicated space gadgets to help gather this ice. One such tool is called Trident. It's like a drill, perfect for digging into the icy moon surface. Additional robotic helpers would then turn this ice into fuel and deliver it to a space gas station. If this works, rockets on their way to Mars could stop by for a quick fuel top-up before continuing their journey. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side.